I like boxing. Boxing's been good to me. I sort of owe it a debt of gratitude. I think that the young fellows should uh, take a chance and learn uh, the out of boxing. Uh, it's too bad that there aren't um, better programming for youngsters, such as uh, Little, League, uh, Little League football and baseball with their uh, great um, organization. I think that boxing should have something like that that leads into golden gloves, and then if the boys like it, of course, professional boxing. Heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. Marciano. Rocky was always the type of person in sports who, who believed that great athletes, the real great ones, find a way to win, and he would always say that. You know, of all the athletes in the history of sports, I don't think there was anyone who was more determined. I don't think there was anyone who you could say was more of a consummate winner than Rocky Marciano. He fought 49 times and never lost. There'll never, ever be another Rocky. There's all kinds of champion baseball players, football players. There'll never be another Rocky. He was a hero to us you know, from when he was young. And before he even became famous, I mean, you know, he was that big brother. Rocky Marciano was a great champion, a great, great champion. And these young kids, they'll eventually read about him. They never saw him, but I tell them that he was the greatest. You know, we always thought he was very special. I don't know why, but we did. We always thought he was very, maybe because he was the oldest, and he was very good with each one of us, you know. When you combine skill with work ethic, with devotion, with a will to win, you cannot be beaten. And that's what Rocky was all about. He knew that when he stepped into the ring that he was going to win the fight because he knew he was the best. Rocky Marciano was the best. I knew when he, the, the roots he came from, I know how he started. I seen him when he was a four round fighter. But he could punch, and he was perseverance, and he trained like a dog. His strength, his endurance for a little guy was remarkable. Rocky Marciano, great talent. In, in any era, he belonged. He was a real champion. Rocky was a winner. When he went out there, you know, the experts didn't think that he could do it because everything uh, is measured by how tall you are, how graceful you are. You know, Rocky Marciano was the ultimate fighter.
Rocky Marciano, 49 professional fights, 49 victories. The only undefeated heavyweight champion in history. In many ways, Rocky's story is the classic tale of the American dream come true. The son of Italian immigrants, Rocky learned about hard work, perseverance, loyalty, and modesty from his parents. First of all, he had, I think, great ethics from his mother and his father. A sense of loyalty and respect. And also, I guess, never really taking no for an answer. And, and I believe that comes really from his Italian background. It comes from his passion to succeed. And no matter what he tackled, he was going to be the best at it. Indeed, the era in which Marciano reigned as champion, the early 1950s, was, on the surface, a much simpler time in America. It was a time when people truly believed in the American dream and the American way of life. Harry Truman was president when the decade began, and he was followed by Dwight D. Eisenhower. Both these men symbolized the strongly held belief that anything was possible in America. Truman was a haberdasher who became president. And Ike was a Kansas farm boy who went on to become the nation's greatest war hero and beloved president. Rocky Marciano was also a strong and enduring symbol of the time, an undersized heavyweight whose fierce determination enabled him to become a great world champion. It was his heart. It was his determination. His mental strength, I think, was every bit as great as his physical strength. He always felt that he could beat any heavyweight because he was in such great condition and always had that confidence that uh, he would be successful in the ring. Americans saw Marciano as a hero and a role model. He was friendly and likable, modest, religious, and devoted to his parents. Rocky was patriotic, having served in the army during World War II. He respected authority and was loyal to his friends. Just a kid from a working-class, blue-collar neighborhood in Brockton, Massachusetts, who became a legend. He symbolized the American dream come true. Rocky was the type of guy that would never, never give up. He was a regular guy. He'd come home from a fight. He'd parked a car in front of the yard. He'd come down the park. He used to throw the football to me when I was down the park. He was just a regular, regular guy. If you met Rocky on the street, you would never know he was the heavyweight champion of the world. He had a heart of gold. He was just gorgeous. He was always nice, nice to the kids, something beautiful. Movie stars, Hollywood, they liked him very, very much. Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, they loved him. Marciano was champion when boxing was second only to baseball in popularity, a time when wearing the heavyweight crown carried with it far more fame, glory, and prestige than it does today. It was also a time when one's ethnicity mattered greatly. Immigrant Americans and their children rooted for their own. Rocky Marciano was an enormously beloved hero to Italian Americans. As you know, Rocky was an ethnic guy. Uh, Mom and Dad were born in Italy. And there's a proverb that really tells what Rocky was all about. And that prover proverb was, fai fat e no paro. Translated, do it. Don't talk about it. At that time, the large majority of Italians that Americans saw or heard about in the media were the infamous gangsters. Italian Americans resented this image of themselves. So Rocky Marciano, along with Joe DiMaggio, came to symbolize what Italians could achieve in this country. Rocky was fiercely proud of his Italian heritage and took quite seriously his role as a hero to his people. That was a lesson that we all learned. Don't ever do anything to dis disgrace the name. And my dad was always very uh, quick to, to defend the Italian heritage and say, you know, for all of the, all of the, the, the bad rap that the Italians get, with the Mafia, there's many, many hardworking and successful Italians who are striving to improve upon themselves. Rocky's reign as champion also came at a time when racial tensions in America were just below the surface. Tensions that would explode into the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Jackie Robinson had broken the color line in big league baseball in 1947. And this was a cornerstone and foundation 
of the civil rights movement to come. But in the early 50s, when Rocky was champ, the civil rights movement was still far in the future. It was not yet the full-fledged social force. Rocky Marciano was the great white hope in a sport that was becoming increasingly dominated by black Americans. Today, most people remember Rocky Marciano for his unblemished record of 49 victories and no defeats and nothing more. This is much too simplistic a view. Indeed, on the surface, the story seems like a simple one, an inspiring tale of an American kid who through hard work, talent, and determination became a champion and a national hero. But underneath it all, the story of his life and his times and the story of the man himself is far more complex. Between 1890 and 1920, over six million Italians immigrated to America. They came seeking a better life for themselves, and more importantly, for their children. Included in this wave of immigrants was Perino Marchegiano. He came from the Abruzzi region of Italy. Upon arriving in America, he migrated to Brockton, Massachusetts, where he found work in a shoe factory. Everybody who got on a boat from Columbus in the, in the 15th century to all those immigrants that were related to were chance takers. Because if they weren't chance takers, they would stay home. They'd stay home in the hills of Calabria. They'd stay on the island of Sicily. They would stay somewhere in Naples. And they wouldn't get on a boat and take a chance and get being insulted in this country. All this stuff that those people, those strong, strong chance taking people took upon themselves to make their lives and the children's life and the grandchildren's life to follow better than what it was in, in the old country. During the First World War, Ferdinand Marcagiano enlisted in the Marines and became part of the American Expeditionary Force in Europe. He was wounded in combat when pieces of shrapnel pierced his jaw. He served in World War I. He was very proud of that. He served honorably. And in fact, his health suffered because of it. He was gassed in a, in a battle in World War I. He was never the same. He was never a robust man to begin with. I mean, you think Rocky Marciano, you think big, you think strong. He didn't get that from his dad. His dad was 5'8", 150, and after the gassing, he was around 130. He was sort of a frail guy, but yet very dignified, very quiet, lots of class, lots of pride. A few years after World War I, a young girl named Pasqualina Pachuto came from Naples to America with her family. Her father, Luigi, had come to America in 1914 and saved enough to bring his family over several years later. The Pachuto family also migrated to Brockton. When Perdina Marcagiana returned home after the war, he met and married Lina Pachuto. They made a good couple because of the stark differences in their personalities. Mom was very, uh, she was out, very outgoing, um, had uh, gone to school and had more education than my dad. Uh, my dad was very quiet. I can remember him working in the shoe factory and he would go to work with a suit and a top hat, all dressed up, and he got to work and he'd change because he worked in a shoe shop, and he'd put the same clothes on to come home, so we always remember him dressed up. We never really saw him in work clothes. Mom was, was uh, a, a, a kind of a robust woman, um, and, and Rocky oftentimes said that he felt as though he got his physical strength from maybe Mom's side of the family. My father uh, was a very quiet man, but determined. My mom was very jolly, happy, very happy, loved company, loved having her friends over for coffee, always had something on the table for them. Um, on a Sunday, she'd make a big sauce, and you know, if I happened to come in with two or three girlfriends, sit down, enjoy, never said, no, I can't feed them, you know. On September 1st, 1923, Pasqualina gave birth to Rocco Francis Marchegiano. Rocco was actually the second child born to the couple. The first had died shortly after its birth. Perino and Lina almost lost Rocky as well when he contracted pneumonia at the age of 18 months. Legend has it that Lina prayed to God that if he would spare her baby son Rocco, she would give up her diamond wedding ring. Lina gladly gave up a ring when Rocky survived. 
Although doctors had told Lena she couldn't have any more children after the death of her first infant, five more children would follow Rocco. Three girls, Alice, Connie, and Elizabeth, and two boys, Louis and Peter. Rocky grew up only 20 miles from Boston, but the city could have been an ocean away. Italian immigrant families like the Maccajanos, who lived in a multi-ethnic New England factory town like Brockton, faced horrible prejudice. Brockton, Massachusetts was the world capital of the shoe industry for close to 100 years. But even in a factory town like this, Italians were greatly outnumbered by first or second generation immigrants from Ireland, Poland, Lithuania, and Sweden. Rocky's family lived in a white two-story house on Brook Street in the center of Brockton's Italian district. It was owned by Lena's father, Luigi, who occupied the first floor, and the Maccajanos living on the second. The home had no running water, no bathtub, nor any heat. During the brutal New England winters, the family had to rely on heat from two coal stoves. Their second floor home was very cramped with only a living room, a kitchen, and two bedrooms. Perino and Lena slept with their younger son, Peter. Their three daughters slept in the other bedroom, and Louis, known to all as Sonny, slept downstairs with his grandfather. Rocky slept in the living room on a mattress near a window. He insisted on keeping the window open, even at the height of winter. We certainly didn't know we were poor. We, we ate the very best, and uh, we always had, uh, there was always enough for the whole family. It was very crowded conditions, and uh, uh, we had a, a cellar that, where my grandfather used to make wine, homemade wine, and from uh, Rocky as a young boy, used to haul all of the grapes into the basement, and that was like a ritual. It was very cramped, <laughs> um, but warm, very warm. Uh, we had a refrigerator, not a, I mean, a, like a nice box rather than a refrig. Um, some little small dining room. Our grandparents were downstairs. It was nice. It was very warm. It was uh, cozy, and it was uh, safe. Verino worked very hard for very little pay at the Stacy Adams Shoe Factory. He was forced to take a non-union job where he had to endure a daily onslaught of verbal insults and anti-Italian prejudice. Perino worried constantly that because he was a non-union worker, he could be fired at any time. He was determined that his children would never have to work in Brockton's shoe industry. My dad uh, enjoyed a nice fresh lunch. My mother would prepare that, call Rocky and scream, into the, scream to him, and Rocky, of course, would hear uh, my mom calling would rush home, get the lunch together, and bring it to my dad. My dad had a very difficult job in the shoe factory as a, a laster. He had both arms, both of his legs were, and tacks in his mouth. And um, my brother Rocky could see early on that this was not something that he wanted to do with the, for the rest of his life. And he, he felt, uh, as we all did, uh, felt Dad, that my dad had to work at such a very difficult job. The hardworking Perino often told Rocky, be somebody, don't ever work in a factory. Seeing his father struggle like this to feed the Maccajano family created a strong, quiet, steel-willed determination in Rocky to make something of himself and to help his family. Life was a struggle for Perino and Lena, but they taught their children respect and loyalty and instilled in them a strong work ethic that would serve Rocky well in later years. They were poor, yet they didn't know they were poor. Um, they had family around, they had friends around, there was food on the table, and there was that remarkable example of work ethic as his father, even with jobs very hard to get in the Depression, going off to work every single day, and despite his health. When Rocky was a teenager, the Maccajano family moved to this larger home on Dover Street, only a few blocks away from their original house. The Maccajano's new home was right across the street from the James Edgar Playground. And as a kid, young Rocco spent many hours playing sports in this park. His childhood was filled with hitting and catching baseballs. He loved the game, dreamed of becoming a big leaguer. Rocky was a shy and quiet boy with a friendly low-key personality. He was, however, involved in some fights as a kid. Rocky wasn't one to start a fight, 
and he was always ready to defend his sisters, brothers, and friends, and on occasion, this led to fisticuffs. Rocky always prevailed. He was always a class act. We were the wise guys that got the fights for him. Rocky was very, very quiet, very shy. He was girl shy, I know that. And um, he was a little, he was always trying to stay in the background. He was not a show-offy kid. He was the big brother that always protected us. And I always felt more protected because I was so much younger. You know, there were times when my mother and father went out to an occasional um, show or whatever. And um, so we were left, we were old enough, you know. Rocky may have been, how old, 15. And um, we were a little frightened to be home alone because we were taking care of Peter and Sonny and the younger ones, you know. And uh, Rocky used to go out and play the uh, playground, play touch football or whatever. And then he'd come home. The minute we heard his footsteps come up those stairs, we just knew we, we felt so safe, you know. Um, he was always a, he was a hero to us. When Rocky was 16 years old, World War II began. This would have a profound effect on his life. At the time, however, these events in Europe were the farthest thing from Rocky's mind. Rockton High School, he tried out for and made the highly ranked football team. As Rocky often stated later in life, he was not a very good student, but he did excel as a linebacker and a center on the Brockton football team. He would often recall the thrill of intercepting a pass and running 65 yards for a touchdown on Columbus Day 1940 against Brockton's arch rival, New Bedford High. Rocky also tried out for the school's baseball team. He was originally chosen as the club's catcher, but was eventually moved to right field because the coach felt he was too slow. In frustration, Rocky joined a church league. He was then cut from the high school team because he broke the school's rule that banned team members from playing on any other clubs. As an athlete, his first love was baseball, you know, but as a young guy growing up, he played all of the sport, baseball, football, basketball, played ice hockey. Uh, he, he, really, he, he really loved athletics. During the spring of 1941, the headlines were dominated by the Nazi bombing of London, which tested the will of Great Britain. At the time, Bruckton's shoe industry was in a shambles, and almost half the town's factories had closed down due to bitter union struggles. The fierce union rivalries were so disruptive that President Roosevelt had to personally intervene to curb the threat of violence. Rocky's parents were struggling to stay afloat. As the family's financial woes mounted, Rocky decided to drop out of high school and get a job. Marciano's work ethic um, really drove the first big decision of his life, which was to quit high school. He quit high school after his sophomore year. He was actually a very good football player for Brockton High. Started as a sophomore, might have gone on to maybe even uh, thinking about getting a scholarship. He was, he was pretty good. He knew that he had to leave school to help support uh, three sisters and two brothers, five other siblings, and, and uh, it had, again, it's like the proverbial puzzle. Every little piece had something to do who Rocky Marciano ended up being. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And America went to war. The national war effort provided Brockton shoe industry with relief from its troubles. Rocky and his father both overruled their previous objections to Rocky working at the Stacy Adams Shoe Factory. Despite the drudgery of factory labor, Rocky seemed to enjoy working with his father and other Italian shoemakers. Rocky's time at the factory was short-lived when he developed an allergy to the leather dust. He had no choice but to quit the factory job. Rocky was still trying to settle on a permanent career path. He was certain of two things. He didn't want to be a laborer like his father, and he wanted somehow to make a name for himself. In 
1943, the 20-year-old Rocky was drafted into the Army. After basic training, he was shipped overseas to Great Britain. He was assigned to the 150th Combat Engineers. His unit was instrumental in ferrying supplies to combat units in the landing at Normandy and in battles in the Rhineland and in the Ardennes. I think the Army was pretty good for Marciano. He ended up uh, training over here in the States and then serving a time in Wales. And I think he saw different people. And I think he came back more determined than ever to get out of this succession of menial jobs that he had sort of chosen for himself. And he, he hadn't finished high school, so he knew the way out, the avenue out, was sports. And that's what he pursued. In 1945, Rocky was shipped back to Fort Lewis in Tacoma, Washington, to await reassignment to the Pacific Theater. The war ended, however, in August of 1945. President Truman ordered atomic bombs to be dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Rocky assumed he would be assigned to the post-war occupation force in Japan. Instead, he was given the opportunity to represent his unit in a series of amateur boxing matches at Fort Lewis. They uh, approached him to try out for the boxing team, and he was, uh, he, he jumped at the opportunity. And of course, it would, didn't take long for them to see that he had the punch to, uh, to knock out most of the opponents in sparring. And yes, it was, it, was, it was a turning point in his life. In the ring, he was awkward, crude, and slow. But he could take a punch, and more importantly, he could deliver one with his devastating right hand. He compiled enough wins to qualify for the National Junior AAU Championships in Portland, Oregon. He made it to the finals, but broke a knuckle in his left hand. He decided to fight in the finals anyway, but lost. After his discharge from the Army in December of 1946, Rocky went to work for the Brockton Gas Company shoveling coal for one dollar an hour. Rocky was uh, a person that was uh, strived to be great no matter what he was doing. Uh, I remember him when he played for the Ward 2 baseball team uh, years ago. He was a catcher. And I remember hit him hitting a home run at Agus Field, bouncing in the middle of the street into the house on the first door. That had to be 450, 500 feet. Rocky had, you know, tremendous power, but he was a dedicated man. Although his sights were set on becoming a ball player, Rocky was still dabbling in boxing. I think when he had that fight, he, I think he realized that, th that this was the start of a boxing career for him. He had a fear of being nobody. He didn't want to be just one of the many, uh, many, many people who sort of was settling back into blue-collar, working-class America after World War II. He wanted to be somebody. He didn't want to be obscure. He didn't want to be broke. In the spring of 1947, Rocky was among several Brockton baseball players invited by the Chicago Cubs to their annual tryout camp held in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Rocky's dream of becoming a star in the national pastime ended when he was cut by the Cubs, and a few days later, cut again by a Class D minor league team. I kind of think that he had some flaws as a baseball player. I've spoken to some guys years ago who saw him play, and, you know, he could hit a long ball, but he wasn't going to get a lot of infield base hits, you know, because he didn't have great running speed. Um, as a defensive catcher, he had some flaws. So he was a long way from being what you might call a true prospect, let's say, to become uh, a major league baseball player. On the lonely ride home to Brockton, Rocky decided to pursue a career in boxing. Boxing seemed the best way out. He wanted to be somebody, and he knew that the only alternative to success in the ring would be a life of hard labor and economic struggle. In 
the very beginning, Rocky was told he had no future in boxing. His detractors insisted that in addition to his being too short at 5 feet 11 inches, he was starting out much too late. Legs were too short and thick, and he was clumsy. What's more, his reach of only 68 inches wasn't anywhere near long enough for a heavyweight. One boxing trainer bluntly told Rocky, you get killed in the ring, kid. Take my word for it. Go home. Rocky ignored his detractors and worked hard. From the spring of 1947 through the spring of 1948, Rocky fought in over 30 amateur bouts. He was crude and raw, but determined. Rocky's good friend, Ali Colombo, manned Rocky's corner. Ali would become a fixture in Rocky's life for the rest of his ring career and beyond. Every neighborhood in the country has an Ali Colombo. Not the real good athlete, but always the guy that, that was the manager, was the trainer, was the guy that, that made out the roster, made out the lineup. He, every, every neighborhood had one, and he was the guy. So it was almost a, an automatic thing that when Rocky got through boxing in the service, came home after the war ended, the first guy that he runs into not only was Ali Clumbo, literally our next door neighbor, however, he was the guy that was that you'd go to. And he went to Ali, and uh, Ali said, I heard you had a, uh, a career in boxing in the Army. Why don't we take it to the next step? Let's, uh, let's see if we can't uh, get you going. And so when Marciano needed someone to train with, to run all those lonely miles in Brockton and the surrounding areas, to um, push the medicine ball at the local Y, Ali was right there with him. He put all the stock in Rocky because he believed in his friend. In early 1948, Rocky won a number of amateur titles in New England, but lost the All Eastern Golden Gloves title to a fighter named Coley Wallace. Many who were at the fight claimed that Rocky beat Wallace and should have won the bout. But the decision went to Wallace. It was Rocky's fourth loss as an amateur. It would also be the last time he ever lost in the ring. He never lost focus of, of uh, attaining uh, his goals, which were to become uh, the very best athlete that he possibly could. And he gained enough confidence to, to realize that he had a future and that he could make a great deal of money in sports. He rebounded from the Wallace fight by winning the New England AAU heavyweight title in March of 1948. Unfortunately, he broke his thumb and was sidelined for six months. It cost Rocky money to get his thumb fixed. Brockton Gas Company had laid him off because of the injury to his hand. Rocky's choice was clear. It was time to turn professional. Rocky turned pro, his family was behind him. Other than that, the only person who truly believed in him was his good friend, Ali Colombo. Rocky worked out relentlessly to get in shape. He knew that when he went into the ring, he needed to be able to outlast the other guy. He knew that it was probably some, some nights he was gonna need that, and he always had that to draw upon. So he had that competitive spirit, he had that fire, he had that thirst to win, and no one was better conditioned. At that time, the one thing Rocky learned above all else had nothing to do with his technique or style of the ring. An older boxer named Eddie Boland told him that the key to success in the fight game was getting a good manager from New York who had connections and influence and having a good and patient trainer. Boland recommended the New York manager trainer team Val Weil and Charlie Goldman. To this end, Ali Colombo wrote a letter to Weil bragging of Rocky's amateur accomplishments and stating that Rock could become world champion with the right manager and trainer. Both Weil and Goldman were short men, but that's where the similarity ended. Weil was cunning, egotistical, and sought the limelight. He was despised in many quarters of the boxing establishment. He was very cocky. Um, he was difficult to talk to. He wanted, uh, he wanted complete control. Abrasive, cunning, 
arrogant, egotistical, controlling. Those are some of the words I would use to describe Al Weil. And he was also a very good fight manager and very well connected. Goldman was the complete opposite. He was guileless, generous, and universally loved throughout the world of boxing. Charlie Goldman was the greatest, greatest trainer who ever lived. One of my, I'm a biggest admirer. And you know what? He was an honorable guy. People loved Charlie Goldman. And Marciano ended up loving Charlie Goldman. He was just a very nice, kind man. And he was a damn good trainer. In the summer of 1948, Weil invited Rocky down to New York for a workout. And Al Weil looked at him immediately, said, you know, kid, where are you from? Brockton, Massachusetts. You know what? Why don't you go back to Brockton, marry a nice girl, have six, seven, eight kids, and enjoy your life. You don't want to be a boxer. But Rocky was determined. Rocky knew what he wanted to do. Al Weil said, okay, uh, sent him over to the gym, meet up with this guy about uh, four foot nine, uh, Charlie Goldman, who looks like he had 350 fights and lost every one of them. And uh, he was the guy, the genius, that saw Rocky, saw him for what he was, and the rest is history. At the CYO gym on West 17th Street, Goldman watched as Rocky sparred with a heavyweight named Wade Chancey. Later, Goldman recalled that Rocky was so awkward that he and Weil laughed out loud. Then, Rock landed a roundhouse right, and according to Goldman, Wade Chancey went out like a mackerel. Rocco Francis Maccagiano had himself a manager and a trainer. Charlie Goldman one day was in Stillman's gym and he said, Angelo, I want you to come with me today. I'm going to the CYO. I got a kid down there from Boston. Clumsy, short, semi-bald, stoop shoulder. But oh, how he could punch, he said. So I went down and I seen him. Rocky Marciano walks in with a little canvas bag. He was staying at the YMCA. And him and I got to be friends immediately because he was a wonderful human being. Rocky and Ali began traveling down to New York, often on the back of a fruit truck to work out with Charlie Goldman. Charlie Goldman saw a guy who was five feet, 10 and a half. So therefore, let's make him a smaller target because he's gonna be fighting the majority of his opponents are gonna be taller than him. So how do you make him, how do you make a smaller target of him? By putting him in a crouch. From the crouch, he learned to deliver just annihilating punches. And this was through a lot of hard training, through dedication, and through the hard work, really, of Charlie Goldman. Early in his pro career, Rocky fought primarily in Providence, Rhode Island. There was no set strategy on Al Wilde's part in this arrangement. Providence just happened to be a good halfway point between Rocky and Brockton and Wilde and Goldman in New York. Wilde left the training of Rocky in the capable hands of Charlie Goldman. Wilde, however, knew the value of good publicity and became concerned with Rock's last name. Fans, writers, even the ring announcer at the Rhode Island Boxing Auditorium were forever butchering the name Marcajano. Wilde suggested Rock change his name to either Rocky Mack or Rocky March. Rocky would have none of it. He wanted everybody to know he was Italian. An associate of Wiles, promoter Manny Almeida, suggested a shorter version of Mark Cacciano. By removing the H, E, and G from the middle of his name, Mark Cacciano became Marciano. In his first year as a pro in 1948, Rocky fought 11 bouts. In eight fights, he scored knockouts in the first round. Two fights went two rounds before Rocky knocked out his opponent. And only one fight went three rounds which also ended with a KO for Rocky. It was like a little celebration at my house every other week when he'd fight in Providence. You know, another win, another win, and I mean, pretty soon you expected another win, <laughs> not realizing all the hard work he's putting into what he's doing, the sweat and blood he does every day, working out, you know. We, it's easy for us to sit back and see someone like a star or a champion, but to do it yourself, you have to work hard, and he did. He was fighting in Providence. Providence has a tremendous contingent of Italians. And of course, Rocky almost became 
instantly a cult hero. Uh, he is to this day, uh, you know, they think that he was from Providence. In those first few professional fights, Rocky didn't have anyone in his corner, except his boyhood friend, Ali Colombo. In the beginning, manager Al Wilde just didn't pay much attention to his new heavyweight. But as the victories mounted up, Wilde watched Rocky's progress more closely. And by the end of 1948, he was touting Rocky as the next great heavyweight. When at home in between fights, Rocky worked out relentlessly. He and Ali Colombo would arise so early that they frequently saw the sun rise while running up Tower Hill in Brockton. He would then turn, walk back down the hill, and run up it again. He did this over and over and over. Rocky later credited the intense training as the key to his remarkable endurance and stamina in the ring. He also had more motivation than ever to become a success. He had fallen in love with a local girl named Barbara Cousins. She would eventually become his wife. In 1949, Weil and Goldman once again put Rocky through a grueling fight schedule. Between March and December of 1949, Rocky fought 14 times. 11 of these bouts he won by knockouts. In addition, he was fighting more skilled boxers than he had in 1948. The boxing world was taking notice of Rocky. One of his early opponents likened being hit by Rocky to being struck by a blackjack or worked over by a jackhammer. His punches were measured by a professor at Harvard and, and there's a writing on it. And this professor gauged the strength of his punching blow to like X amount of pounds of, it's almost like a small automobile hitting you. Marciano basically stayed in Providence for a year and a half. And he had, um, he had a couple of tough, tough fights, uh, one with a guy by the name of Tiger Ted Lowry, whose style drove him crazy and actually was ahead halfway through the fight before Marciano rallied. In late December of 1949, Rocky faced a tough challenge when he was matched against the highly rated Carmine Vingo. Rocky knocked Vingo out in the sixth round. He was doing a job on Rocky, then Rocky went at him, it's unbelievable. Jab, 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 jab. And then he uh, put him down on the floor. And then I saw Dr. Vincent Nadiello come up and uh, hit him with the needle right near the, on the hat there, or some part of the chest. And then I told, what's the name? I says, I says, this man is in bad shape. And he was in bad shape. After Vingo went down, the referee and Vingo's handlers tried to revive him, but to no avail. Vingo was rushed to the hospital where he lapsed into a coma. He hurt Carmen Vingo pretty bad. Uh, sent him to the hospital. I think Rocky felt worse about worse than uh, than, uh, than anybody else would feel in, on the Carmen Vingo fight because that's the type of guy Rocky was. You know, he, he wasn't vindictive. He wasn't a type of guy who was saying, you know, I'm sorry that I did it, uh, I'm, but I'm glad he isn't. He wasn't that type of guy. He 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 probably felt worse about that fight than anybody else. I think it was a crossroad. Uh, I think Rocky could have gone either way at that point in time. Uh, I know it was devastating to him to think that he almost took the life and, and, and to this day, Carmen Vingo is, is partially paralyzed. Uh, I think Rocky at that point in time understood what boxing was really all about. And I think at that point in time, he knew that boxing was a dangerous sport and that these things could happen. As the new decade of the 50s began, Rocky Marciano was on the verge of greatness. But even Rocky in his wildest dreams could not have imagined what fate had in store for him. They were two young heavyweights, and a lot of the fight mobs said, you know what, these two guys, they're going to be fighting for the title soon. And it became a big fight. It was on a Friday night in New York in March 1950, and it happened to be on television on all the East Coast. And it was really Marciano's um, first big fight. Rocky lost one round due to a low blow, which was very controversial. It was a low blow, but it wasn't, it didn't in any way hinder or hurt Roland Lestaza. The referee did take, I believe it was the fifth round, 
away from Rocky, which made it a closer fight. It was one of Rocky's better rounds. Give Rocky the fifth round, I believe it's a unanimous decision and there's no questions about it. Although Rocky won the La Starza fight, this bout probably hurt him more than it helped him. He won, but not decisively. And many questioned whether he was ready to take on more accomplished fighters, such as Ezra Charles or Jersey Joe Walcott. As 1950 drew to a close, Rocky once again faced the crafty Ted Lowry. And again, Lowry gave Rocky fits. But Marciano prevailed in a 10-round decision. I met the fellow uh, three months ago, and I was at a boxing hall of fame, uh, and Tiger Ted Lowry was there. I went over and I shook his hand, you know, I says, you know, you're a great man, you fought Rocky. So he, I says, I was at both those fights. I was a kid then. And he says, tell you the truth, he says, uh, I won the first one, didn't I? I says, he didn't come out that way, I said. You know, and he laughed. But, you know, he, he's a piece of history now, boxing history, he fought Rocky. In the summer of 1950, Rocky felt financially secure enough to marry his longtime girlfriend, Barbara Cousins. Although they were happy together for many years, the demands of Rocky's career, the many months spent in training, and the nights on the road took their toll on the marriage. They had a daughter, and later they adopted a son. And although they remained married until Marciano's untimely death, it was not in the end a happy marriage. In 1951, Rocky knocked out the first three opponents he faced. Keen Simmons, Harold Mitchell, and Art Henry. He then decisioned Red Applegate in 10 rounds at the end of April. After the Applegate victory, Al Wilde set up a July 12th showdown with the highly rated Rex Lane. Battle-tested Lane was a big attraction, and he was installed by the New York writers as the clear favorite in his bout with Marciano. Rex Lane was very highly thought of at the time. He had just beaten uh, Walcott, and uh, it was a fight that I think, again, the experts uh, kind of thought that this might be the guy that might do to Rocky what the experts thought should have maybe happened much earlier. On the night of July 12, 1951, thousands crowded into a steaming hot Madison Square Garden, and thousands of others watched on the innovative viewing option of closed circuit television. It's the sixth round, Rocky Marciano against Rex Lane. The Rock has won 36 straight fights. It looks like Lane is tiring. He lowers his guard, not a smart move against Rocky. Rocky throws his right, and Lane goes down. He's down and out. Marciano knocks out the top Rex Lane. After the Lane victory, that really was, that signaled Marciano's arrival on the scene. He was on the Ed Sullivan Show, even his critics, who had scoffed at his unbeaten record and had sort of labeled it a made in Providence phenomenon, said, you know what, he is the best young heavyweight man. And suddenly, he was in the title picture. Rex Lane, I believe, was the favorite in that fight. And Rocky hit him with, some, with a punch that most people that have viewed that fight said, you know, they did, really almost didn't see it. And he fell forward and uh, he took quite a while to revive him. Many people began to compare Rocky to the legendary Jack Dempsey, if only because both were white. Indeed, Marciano was the first white boxer with a chance at the crown in almost 15 years. Rocky Marciano became, for many, the great white hope. Rocky himself would never publicly discuss this subject. His boxing idol had always been the great Joe Lewis, and Rocky had profound respect for many of the top black boxers, like Jersey Joe Walcott, Ezra Charles, and Archie Moore, all of whom he hoped to meet in the ring someday. In August of 1951, Rocky KO'd Fred B. Shore in four rounds, and a fight with the legendary Joe Lewis was set for October 26th at Madison Square Garden. Joe Lewis was a revered national hero. As a young fighter before World War II, Lewis was truly great. Many felt that he was perhaps the greatest of all time. He held the heavyweight crown from 1937 to 1949 when he retired. But in the post-war years, he had lost his edge and was not the same fighter. The fact is, Joe Lewis should never have come out of retirement. Years of reckless spending 
and bad financial advice had left the champ deeply in debt. He owed the IRS over half a million dollars in back taxes. He fought heavyweight champion Ezra Charles in 1950, was badly beaten, and retired once again. But he came back in 1951. Lewis wanted a crack at Joe Walcott, who had taken the title from Ezra Charles. Walcott had decided not to defend his title until the summer of 1952. And then he would once again fight Charles. Joe Lewis just couldn't wait that long. He needed a fight because he needed a payday very badly. Joe had no choice but to take on the only other big name on the scene, Rocky Marciano. Lewis studied film of the Marciano Lane fight and felt confident he could beat Rocky. For his part, Rocky seemed quite calm and assured in the months and days leading up to the battle. He only hoped that when he did beat Lewis, as he was confident he would, people wouldn't categorize it as beating up and over the hill, yet still beloved former champion. Joe Lewis, if you look back, uh, had just come off 12 fights, won all of them against some pretty good competition. And uh, so Lewis was still someone to be reckoned with. His left jab was, was, was lethal. And uh, so there were some major concerns in the Marciano camp, in Rocky's camp, as how he was going to approach this fight. It's the eighth round, Marciano versus Lewis. Lewis goes down. He's on one knee. Joe gets to his feet and Rocky attacks. It looks like Marciano wants to end the fight right now. Joe is trying to hold on. Rocky wants to land that one punch that will end the fight. Rocky lands a left and then a right and down goes Joe Lewis. It's all over. The former champ can't get to his feet. He's being helped to his feet by the referee. Lewis looks dazed. Rocky Marciano is the winner by a knockout. When Rocky knocked out Joe Lewis, Rocky was crying behind him going back to the dressing room and I was crying behind Rocky because he knocked out Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was a great fighter. Great fighter and a great guy. Rocky was a remarkable fighter. Rocky, let me tell you, anybody that got to see him loved him. And hey, I was there one night when he stopped Joe Lewis, and I cried because Joe was such a great human being. And Joe and I were pals till the day he died. After the fight had distraught, Rocky attempted to comfort his defeated hero in the dressing room. Rocky later said that he felt that many boxing fans in the garden that night hated him for ending the career Dear Joe Lewis. After the Lewis fight, Rocky Marciano was able to realize a lifelong dream when he told his father that he could finally retire from the shoe factory. Rocky was secure enough financially to take care of his parents for the rest of their lives. It was a moment Rocky had dreamed about since he was a boy. February of 1952, Rocky fought another big name heavyweight, Lee Savold in Philadelphia. Rocky is missing Savold with a number of punches, but he's also landing quite a few. Savold is deceptive and hard to hit. Rocky is the favorite in tonight's fight. It seems like nothing can stop him as he bores in on Savold. Marciano has 39 victories and no defeats with 32 knockouts. Savold is having a tough time staying on his feet. In the seventh round, Savold cannot answer the bell. Another victory for the Brockton blockbuster, Rocky Marciano. After the Savold fight, Rocky's reputation took a bad hit. He had defeated Savold, but looked awful in doing so. He threw punches wildly and often missed. Once again, he heard the criticisms of awkward, clumsy, and slow. When he fought Lee Savold, Rocky had some 
about like the flu or something. I don't know what the heck it was. And he wasn't feeling too great. He weighed 179 for that fight. And he did look bad because he was weak. But he got, got away with it. There were questions raised as to whether or not Rocky was a legitimate contender. Rocky's next two fights took place in Rhode Island where he defeated Gino Buonavino in April and Bernie Reynolds in May. He looked superb in both bouts and regained the standing in the heavyweight division. He then fought Harry Matthews on July 28th at Yankee Stadium. Matthews had won 70 straight fights and was at the time the fifth ranked heavyweight in the world. Marciano is boring in on Matthews. He's looking for that opening to try and end this fight with one punch. And there it is. Kate Matthews is down. He tries to get up, but he can. Another knockout for Marciano. The punch that knocked out Harry Kid Matthews was an unbelievable, if you ever view that fight, to see that he threw three punches. He threw a jab, a left hook, and then he caught him with the second left hook. That took some kind of an athlete to have that happen, it's very difficult to do. Charlie Goldman told him at the beginning of the second round, that left there is gonna be there for you. Look for an opportunity. And suddenly he saw the opportunity and unleashed about three or four in a row. Absolute crunching lefts that devastated Matthews and knocked him out. September 23rd, 1952, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Rocky Marciano versus Jersey Joe Walcott for the heavyweight championship of the world. In a little over three years, Rocky Marciano had come from complete obscurity to worldwide fame. And now he stood on the precipice of everything he had ever dreamed of. Marciano actually had a little stage fright in the Walcott fight when he finally got the chance for the title. He wasn't Fear, he didn't fear Jersey Joe Walcott. In fact, I don't think he feared anyone. But the whole scene, and it was a big fight in Philadelphia, and there were a lot of, biggest fight in years. Here was the popular old champion, the Cinderella story, Jersey Joe Walcott, against the rising young heavyweight Rocky Marciano, and it really galvanized the town and the sports world. Walking down the street with Rocky, uh, I said, Rock, how, how do you feel about this fight? Jersey Joe Walcott's a great fighter. And I could see his eyes were penetrating, almost upset. And he said, do you have any doubts that I will win this fight and win the title? And it bothers me that you would even think that I have a chance of losing this fight. I will not lose this fight. He says, I absolutely will not allow this to happen. It's the first round and Walcott is on the attack. Marciano is down, he's down. It's the first time in his pro career that Rocky has been on the canvas, but he's up at the count of three. Jersey Joe Walcott fought the absolute best fight of his career. And he came out in the first round and to the, to the surprise of everyone, knocked Marciano down. And Marciano up to that point had been a little bit awed by the proceedings and was sort of fighting almost in a trance. And that woke him up, and it woke him up quick. And then a strange thing happened. It was in the sixth round. Something got in Marciano's eyes. It was never really fully explained. Charlie Goldman thought it was liniment that they had been rubbing on Walcott. It happened after a clinch. Marciano was essentially blind, very blinded, for two or three rounds. And they were dangerous rounds because he really couldn't see Walcott. And the guy who really saved the day that night was Freddie Brown. He was a cut guy that Al Weil and Charlie Goldman would bring in for the night of the fight. And he sat in front of Marciano after Marciano was, was, was blinded. He was, Marciano was in his corner, I can't see, I can't see. And Freddie Brown said very calmly with the corner was an, an uproar. And Freddie Brown basically looked at Marciano and said, just go out there and pound him. That's what Marciano did. Didn't win the rounds because he couldn't really see, but he survived. It's the 13th round, and Rocky needs a knockout to win the bout, and he knows it. Rocky is on the attack, moving in on the 22-year veteran. And there's a hard right by Rocky, and Walcott is down. He's down, and he is counted out. Rocky Marciano is the new heavyweight champion of the world.
I was an 11 year old kid at the time. I was sitting uh, in the press section of the fight and it was outdoors and all that I can remember is looking outside the stadium and my big brother, who in my opinion was like next to God, I mean, he just couldn't be beat. And I'm looking at this guy really in the early rounds, pushing him around pretty good. Finally, 13th round came. It seemed like it was a 73rd round, but, but it was a 13th round and Rocky, you could see him coming on. He just became stronger and stronger in his tremendous determination. And in the 13th round, that, that, that straight right against the ropes, I can, I can see it now. And my brother just became the heavyweight champion of the world. I don't think you, at the moment, you realize you're having such a good time and you see all these people screaming and yelling and celebrities. And I don't think it hits you until a few days later when you really realize what he did accomplish. But the greatest moment in that fight, and, and I get goose pimples when I think about it, was a moment, and it took place when Rocky knocked out Walcott, and he was walking around the ring, and in that moment, Ali Clumbo jumped out from the corner. They embraced in the middle of the ring, they had words, they said something, they whispered something to one another. No one ever knows what they said. I only can believe that they had to say, we made it. Two guys from Brockton, from the Ward 2 area of Brockton, two Italian kids that just didn't have a whole lot going on for them, and here we are. We are at the pinnacle of what we wanted to do. When he became the champion in 1952, September 23rd, we were in the same hotel, my room and adjoining. And uh, it was about quarter of five in the morning, and we were exhausted. And uh, he says, uh, he come over to my bed, he says, Nitch, uh, he says, uh, I didn't say Rocky. I says, yeah, champ. He says, let's go for a walk. I says, let's go. And uh, Rocky says, Nick, I'm the champ of the world. I said, you're beautiful. Rocky Marciano was now the heavyweight champion of the world, a title he would never relinquish in the ring. Rocky was able to fulfill many of his lifelong dreams. He sent his parents on a vacation to Italy to visit their hometowns. He bought a nine-room ranch house in a fashionable Brockton neighborhood. Rocky Marciano was living the American dream. Then, on December 6, 1952, Barbara Marciano gave birth to their daughter, Mary Ann. Rocky had now embarked on his journey as world champion, and perhaps more importantly, as an American icon who, in so many ways, symbolized the era in which he reigned. Marciano really ended up personifying the American way of life. He ended up really embodying everything that we wanted to see in our country. The image makers of the day ascribed to him to the, the qualities, many of them were too true, of kindness, of gentleness, family man, loyalty, devotion, patriotic, simplicity, down the line. And this was an era in which the president was a Eisenhower. Everyone liked that. So consensus was really valued, and Marciano fit that consensus perfectly in the early 1950s. One, one of the other things that, that made Rocky great is he didn't forget where he came from. He always got in that ring and it said Brockton, Massachusetts. And he could have said New York, he could have said Florida, he could have said, but Brockton, Massachusetts, and he never forgot that. And, and the people never forgot that. Unlike most celebrities who, who get caught up in, in their success, Rocky never really got caught up in it. He actually didn't, didn't like it when people fussed over him and told him how great he was. I think this is what separated him from most other athletes, and that was a, that was a uh, beautiful uh, thing to see. In the early 1950s, the hero's public image was shaped primarily by the press. Television was still in its infancy. The press loved Marciano. 
He's portrayed as the ideal man of the early 50s. He was a family man. He was loyal to his friends and respected authority. Point of fact, this image of the champion that the press created was, for the most part, quite true. Rocky did indeed possess all these qualities, but he was also human and had his character flaws as well. But these flaws were never reported in the press. Rocky was somewhat strange when it came to the subject of money. He was, to say the very least, frugal. I think it had a lot to do with the fact um, that he'd grown up in the Depression, there wasn't a lot around, didn't trust banks, didn't trust lawyers. Probably that's not a bad thing. The people that you have to ask are the people that were closest to him, family. Uh, as a young kid growing up, not that I went to him often, but uh, never once did he say no to me. Um, as a son to my mom and dad, uh, he just couldn't do enough for them. When you talk to many of his friends, he got so many guys started in different businesses. When my mother and father first got married, Rocky was their paper boy. In the winter, he used to deliver the papers and sneakers. Nobody gave Rocky anything. So why should Rocky give anything away? Whatever he accumulated, he did it on his own. Occasionally, a writer would mention that Rocky was a bit frugal, but that was it. What's more, his image as the ideal family man was somewhat exaggerated by the media. Because of his training schedule and his frequent public appearances all across the nation, Rocky was hardly ever at home. When he retired in 1956, Rock and his wife estimated that in the previous four years, Rocky had spent only 152 days at home. Rocky most certainly enjoyed the limelight and his worldwide celebrity status. And for all his modesty, Marciano could never go back to living a quiet, settled life in suburbia. He was a man who had always wanted to make a name for himself and who thoroughly enjoyed the many accolades and perks fame brought to him. Ladies and gentlemen, the heavyweight champion of the world wearing black trunks, 186 and a half pounds, Rocky Marciano. Rocky. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Rock. Say, Eddie, I just, I just didn't fly in. No? I've been here since the beginning of the show. Oh, really? And, Daddy, I'm pretty sensitive. Yeah? I heard easy. You see, when you announced the show, you almost forgot me. What does a guy have to do to be remembered? <laughs> well, I was only kidding. You know me. You're an uh, old Grossinger pal. That's a fact. Rocky and I trained at the same place. He is a fighter and I as a singer. Right, Rock? That's right, Eddie. Only, uh, the only difference is that nobody punched me in the nose. In the Italian-American community, Marciano was, along with Joe DiMaggio, the most beloved hero of the 20th century. Marciano was very much in Italian, liked Italian food, often talked about visiting Italy, felt really a connection, a strong connection emotionally with other Italian Americans. And that's something you probably wouldn't see today. We're in a different America today. But at the time, he meant a lot to Italians, and Italians meant a lot to him. At this time, strong stereotypes still existed about Italians. They were labeled by many as lazy, over-emotional, sneaky, clannish, and it was believed by many that because Italians had dark complexions, they were not entirely Caucasians at all. Early in his career, Rocky was often a victim of these stereotypes. He was frequently described as a swarthy Italian. As his fame grew, this stereotyping became less frequent. Rocky was definitely not lazy, nor was he over-emotional, nor sneaky. And like almost all Italian-Americans who achieve fame in America, even to this day, he was subjected to the stigma of organized crime. The thing that always bothers me is when somebody really does a good job and keeps his mouth shut, somebody's always saying, oh, the mafia. Yeah, the mafia helped him. That helped I mean, that's, that's the, the one thing that, that we, we've had to live with that we have not been able to, to, to put aside. I think that's terrible. We should not stand for it. We cannot allow that to be said about us because there are so many, so many American Italians who did so much for this great nation of ours. There can be no question that organized crime controlled boxing during Iraqi's era. 
and that mobster Frankie Carbo ruled the sport with an iron fist. Still, when Rocky fought, he tried to steer clear of mobsters, and for the most part, they steered clear of him. Without a doubt, Rock's manager Al Wilde dealt with Frankie Carbo. Marciano himself tried to avoid contact with organized crime figures. There was, a, there was an occasion where somebody approached Marciano um, about taking, taking some money to, to carry a fight for a certain length. Marciano became enraged. How dare you try to sully my dignity by having me engage in this? Get out of my face. Get out of here. He wanted nothing to do with it. After he retired, Rocky did form friendships with a few men who were known to be mobsters. But these men, like all other fight fans, were thrilled just to be near the champ. It is also a fact that Rock was never, in any way, involved in any illicit dealings with these people. He had far too much integrity for that. I think he was very proud of the fact that he accomplished exactly what he set it out to do. He loved the idea that my mother and father were so proud of him. He wanted to do something that exactly what happened. He wanted to leave his name to be remembered for many years after he passed on. You know, when he came home for a visit, which was, you know, quite often to see my mother, we, I got a thrill seeing him come in the door myself. Just, you know, just like he was a, he was a celebrity, but we all got excited, you know, seeing him. Marciano took enormous pride in the fact that he was a role model for kids. He was great with kids, great with kids. Stories of him, you know, signing autographs. Um, he would always try to pick out the ones that were shy. He really took it seriously, and he had great, enormous respect and pride in the fact that he was heavyweight champion of the world. And so, in the end, did Rock's image as the clean-cut, simple, modest, and humble all-American hero truly fit the man? In large part, it did. Rocky had his character flaws, as all people do. But on balance, in assessing his life, Rocky was, at his core, a man of character, dignity, courage, and modesty, and a man who most certainly deserved his status as an all-American hero. In the first round, Rocky Marciano goes on the attack against Walcott. In their last bout, Jersey Joe knocked down Marciano for the first time in Rocky's pro career. This is the first round of a fight scheduled for 15 rounds. But Rocky is moving in, looking to land a payoff punch. And there it is, a hard right, and Jersey Joe Walcott is down. He's down for the count. Rocky Marciano was a firm believer in one principle. Volume, volume, volume. He didn't care if his punches missed. He wanted to throw as many as he could, tire the guy out, wear him down, get the guy back on his heels, control the tempo of the fight. After his first round victory of a Walcott, Marciano again faced Roland Lastaza in 1953. Lastaza was still claiming that he had been robbed in their first bout back in 1950. What's more, Lastaza told the press that Rocky had taken too many punches to the head and was punch drunk. This infuriated Rocky. I believe, to my knowledge, the only time that Rocky went in the ring with personal feelings of animosity uh, was the time that he fought Roland Lastaza, and it was all due to the uh, things that Lastaza said in the media. We're in round 11. Marciano likes to work in close to his opponents. With his short reach, Marciano has an advantage at close range. Rocky lands one of his blockbusters and La Starza is dazed. He falls through the ropes. La Starza has never been knocked down before. He's up at the count of three. Marciano moves in quickly and La Starza looks helpless in the face of the Marciano onslaught. The referee jumps in and stops the fight. Rocky is still the heavyweight champion of the world. In 1954, 
Rocky would endure two of the most brutal bouts in his reign as heavyweight champion. On June 17th, Rocky squared off against former champ Ezard Charles in New York. The fight lasted 15 torturous rounds. It's the 15th round. From the 10th round on, the bout has been going Marciano's way, and he definitely has more strength in his final round. Rocky just continues to hit Charles, and Charles is barely able to stay on his feet. It looks like Ezra Charles is just running out of gas. There's the bell, and it's over. Both men fought hard right to the end, but Rocky wins it by a decision. The rematch with Charles took place on September 17th, once again in New York. In this fight, Rocky, always a bleeder, would get the single worst cut of his entire career. In the sixth round, after the two fighters came out of a clinch, Rocky's nose was badly cut. A big gash ran down the center of it. He was bleeding profusely. He knew that if the blood kept flowing, the fight might be called. It's the eighth round. Rocky has suffered a bloody gash down the center of his nose, and Charles opened another cut over Rocky's eye. But Rocky keeps coming on strong. Marciano is bleeding from his nose and his eye, but his hard punches are hitting home. And down goes Charles again. Rocky is now hitting Charles with one punch after another. The challenger goes down again, and this time it's for good. It's all over. Marciano is the winner by a knockout. There's a word used in sports called clutch, and it's used often in basketball and in baseball and in football. For some reason, it's not used a lot in boxing. If there was ever a clutch boxer, it was Rocky Marciano. When he needed a quick knockout, when the blood was flowing against Ezra Charles, absolutely needed one, another clutch moment, comes up big again. He knew what needed to be done. He was a clutch guy, and that's what made him a winner. Rocky, yeah. <laughs> just, between, uh, just between the two of us, nobody else here, uh, what about the fight? Eddie was a lot tougher than many think. You were there, you know. As a child, was a good opponent. But something happened, and my manager, Al Wilde, gave me some great advice. Eddie, you know Al Wild. Sure. Hi, Al. Al Wild. <laughs> what uh, What was that special thing that you uh, told Rocky about at the end of the special, the uh, very, I should say, special seventh round? Rocky came back <clears throat> at the seventh. Excuse me. Rocky came back at the end of the seventh round. His nose was in very bad shape. I said to Rocky, "This is your only round." If you don't go out this round and knock this fella out, I may have to stop this fight. The cut was very bad, Eddie. You'll never realize it. Dr. Rubin fixed it up so you can't tell. Wow. And Dr. Schiff also in New York. Here he is. I brought him here. And Eddie, you and him are two real champions. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al, and I think it was wonderful, Rocky, of you to come all the way from New York to be on the show tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Rocky Marciano and Al Wilde. Yes, that's good. Eight months after his knockout of Ezra Charles, Rocky faced British heavyweight champion Don Cockle in San Francisco in May of 1955. It's just amazing that Cockle is still on his feet. He has to go down soon. He can't take much more. Rocky is landing punch after punch. The British champion is showing great courage, and Marciano is having a tough time getting him to go down. Hitting him with shot after shot. He can't take much more of this. Rocky bores in again, throwing punches at will. Cockle looks bewildered and dazed. And finally, the referee stops the fight. In September of 1955, Rocky defended his title against an aging Archie Moore. It was a much tougher fight than he had expected. It's round two. Down goes Marciano for only the second time in his career. Rocky gets up and goes back at Archie Moore. It's now round eight, and Rocky Marciano has not let up at all. He's still on the attack. Moore is trying to defend himself, but Rocky is always moving in. He just won't stop. And Archie Moore is down again. In the ninth round, Rocky is once again hitting Moore with everything he's got. Moore hits the canvas again. He's exhausted and he just can't get up. The winner and still champion, 
Rocky Marciano. In my eyes, I think that I think that he was the greatest heavyweight of all time. And, and I think there were other great heavyweights, Joe Lewis and I think Muhammad Ali. But I really think that Rocky, to overcome what he had to overcome, um, his, his height, his reach, his short reach, and, and to never turn down a fight, he wanted to fight anyone out there who was worthy of a, of a shot. After the Moore fight, Rocky's professional record stood at 49 victories and no defeats with 43 knockouts. He had defended his title six times and knocked out his opponent in five of those bouts. He was now 32 years old and he'd had enough. He had seen too many fighters hang on past their prime and live to regret it. Rock was going to get out while he was on top. And so on April 27, 1956, Rocky Marciano announced his retirement from the ring. His wife had pleaded with him to do so. And what's more, Rocky found out that his manager, Al Weil, had reportedly taken $10,000 of Rocky's share from the cockle bout. Rock vowed he would never fight for Weil again. I uh, promised my wife that I would retire before the month of May arrived. Uh, we were on a vacation in South America when I made that promise. It started becoming a job at the end when he was getting ready for his last fight, Archie Moore. And I think he realized that. And he said, you know what? Again, going back to the Italian, the ethnic thing, I don't want to scumbody my family. I don't want to scumbody my Italian heritage. Scumbody, you know what that means. Embarrass. Maybe I got to start thinking about retiring. I like to profit by others' mistakes, and if Joe Lewis couldn't make a successful comeback, I will not try it. Joe, I keep looking at that picture up there with uh, the former president. Great, great day. It seems like we're always meeting at a testimonial or a benefit. But Joe, on that day, when we sort of lined up in the White House uh, corridor, I was about the sixth guy in line, and you were about the 34th. You were way down the other end, and when the president came by, he spoke to me. I was so nervous, I, I didn't know what to do. He kept on going around, and he didn't stop at any one athlete. There were 49 of us, but when he got to you, he stopped, shook your hands, and it seemed like about two minutes he talked to you personally. Well, well, what could I well, ask you what he was saying? Actually, uh, Rocky, it seemed like two minutes, but I guess it was just a few seconds. I, too, was very nervous. I didn't know what he was going to say to me because he had gone on after he shook my hand and then decided to come back to say a few words. And uh, it was, uh, he says, Joe, have you ever, ever been to Paris? And I says, yes. He says, you ever drop into a, an eating place by, and of course he named a name and I don't remember. He says, there's a fellow there, it looks just like you. He says, do you remember uh, the place? And I said, no, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. President, I don't. But uh, evidently the fellow, there's a dead ring upon me. Joe, uh, he made that one little, uh, little talk to us. And when he finally said that at one time, he wished that he could hit a baseball uh, like you did, and he looked right at Joe, and then he looked right at me and said, and, and there was a time when I, I guess I wish I could uh, throw a right hand like you do, and uh, we were the two proudest guys in that group, I think. I would say so, Rocky, and I must say that I have seen you throw many a right <laughs> hand. You know, I'm quite a uh, boxing fan myself. You don't have to tell me, uh, Joe. I was always to your fights, of course, and to uh, many other fights as well. For the rest of his life, Rocky would make a living just being Rocky Marciano the only undefeated heavyweight champion in history. He made numerous personal appearances all across the nation and was honored by virtually every Italian-American organization in the country. Rocky also got involved in numerous business deals, some of which worked out and some of which failed. By and large, Rocky was very well off 
and spent most of his time traveling around the country. Unfortunately, Rocky and his wife had grown apart over the years, and Rock's constant traveling, even after he retired, put an even bigger strain on the union. I kind of think that uh, um, Rocky uh, had, had a wonderful relationship, you know, with, with, with his wife, Barbara. Um, but I think they kind of grew in different directions at some point in time. However, um, Rocky being uh, the, the uh, again, with the Italian uh, background, uh, Catholic background, uh, the marriage stayed together. They tried to make it work. It was in 1969 that a Miami advertising executive named Murray Warner came up with an idea to stage a computerized super fight between the undefeated Marciano and the legendary Muhammad Ali, who had been stripped of his heavyweight title for his refusal to be drafted into the Army. Detailed information about both fighters was fed into a computer, and the outcome of the fight was determined by the computer's top-secret analysis of this information. Then, in an empty warehouse in Miami, Ali and the 45-year-old Rocky staged the fight according to the computer results. Angelo Dundee, Rocky's longtime friend and Ali's trainer, was at the filming. Rocky never liked Muhammad. He talked too much. He talked too much. He's a nice kid. You don't know him. Don't get mad at him. So we got to meet him at the computer fight. They're both fat, sloppy, and the God bless the camera did a heck of a number on both of them. It looked plausible, really. During the entire filming, Ali called Rocky champ, never Rocky or Mr. Marciano. It was the ultimate sign of respect Ali could show Rocky. Only when the film was released in theaters the following year would anyone know the final results. I wish the world, instead of seeing the computer fight, could have seen films of Muhammad Ali and Rocky Marciano uh, sharing grapefruits, sitting on the floor of the hotel room where this took place. And, and what they were discussing, and at that time, this whole thing came out with the black white thing and and there was a lot of uh, bad things happening in our country and guess what they were talking about how they could do something to make things better in this in this country of ours sadly the champ would not live long enough to find out that in the stage super fight he had knocked out Ali in the 13th round the facts of Rocky's death are simple and tragic on August 31st, 1969, a small plane carrying Rocky Marciano crashed in a Newton, Iowa field during a storm. Rocky and two others on the plane were killed. Champ was one day shy of his 46th birthday. My brother Lou was living in California at the time, uh, and I certainly lived in Brockton, uh, a mile from mom and dad. And a very close friend of mine, Henry Tartaglia, uh, was uh, working as a bartender late into the night, and he called me about two o'clock in the morning and uh, woke me up and said, Pete, have you heard anything that went on? And he had heard that there was a plane crash, that Rocky Marciano uh, was on the plane that uh, that he was killed, and uh, when I told mom, and I tried, I went over to the house obviously, and when I told her, she, her immediate words out of her mouth, which I will never forget, was "Filia me, God of the mom, my son, the heart of my life," and it was uh, very, very tough to take. I was living in Saratoga, California, which is right outside of San Jose, California. Um, was watching the late news and there was a news flash that said heavyweight champion from Massachusetts killed in a plane crash. Immediately the blood rushed to my head. I stood up and I screamed. I just remember getting the phone call and going to my mom's and, and her. She was like hysterical. She was just screaming. You know, card of the mom, card of the mom, heart, loved my heart, you know, and everyone was just devastated. 
I mean, it was just my father, you know, his head in his hands, and it was just awful. It was a terrible night. I was in the automobile uh, to bring my daughter to school. And then it came over the radio. In the end, the true measure of a man is not what he accomplished for himself in his life, but how he touched the lives of other people. Rocky Marciano touched the lives of millions of people by virtue of his character, courage, modesty, and generosity. Indeed, no champion ever wore the heavyweight crown with more dignity, integrity, and humility than did Rocky Marciano. Since Rocky's time, there have been a number of great heavyweights. Some, like Muhammad Ali, have had far more charisma. And to this day, Rocky Marciano still has his detractors who say that he was overrated and fought at a time when the heavyweight division was weak. But in the end, an athlete's accomplishment can be judged by one thing and one thing only, the record. The record shows that Rocky Marciano fought 49 professional fights and won every time. The record shows that in 43 of these victories, Rocky knocked out his opponent. The record shows that Rocky Marciano, the Italian kid from Brockton, is the only undefeated heavyweight champion in boxing history. When it comes to determining who is the greatest heavyweight champion of all time, Rocky Marciano's record speaks for itself. Winner by America!